Luke chapter 7, verses 29 and 30. It says, When all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Uh, for different reasons, this just illustrates that baptism has consistently been controversial. Uh, what were all the reasons for it? some of their refusal to accept the baptism of John? Uh, that, that's just one set of reasons why baptism was controversial to then. Today, of course, we're not primarily concerned with the baptism of John, but controversy, controversy still continues today, even, even in the matter of, well, what, what do we do with water? Do we pour water, sprinkle water, immerse in, be immersed in it? Or, as we'll see later, there, there's other things we could do and do with the water. Uh, what, what is it that, that God expects? So we're going to look at, at that subject this morning, what, into the nature of what is baptism. Is it pouring, sprinkling, immersion, all of the above, none of the above, some of the above, one of the above? That's what we're going to seek to answer this morning. Hebrews chapter 5, though, I want to begin by just reminding us why, why would we study this? I don't know that anyone has suggested that we pour water or sprinkle water on anybody, so why, why do we need to spend a portion of our morning on this subject? First of all, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. Hebrews 5, 12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So this passage gives the introduces, I don't know that there's any other passage that uses this exact phrase of, the first principles. Maybe other passages talk about milk and meat, but that's, that's the idea here. First principles. And so if, if baptism, if we could agree, well, baptism is a first principle, then that's something that we need to understand for ourselves. And then as these were reminded in verse 12, that there comes some time, and that's different for all of us when that time is. God didn't say after one month of being a Christian, two years of being a Christian, different for all of us for different reasons, but at some point, we not only have to know the first principles, we have to know them well enough to be able to teach them to some degree. And so, to help us avoid uh, being the uh, falling into the, the trap of weakness that are described here, we're going to study to, to understand the first principle and then to develop ourselves to be able to teach well. Verse 13 would give us another reason to study this subject. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And that's not, that's not really a rebuke. That's the reality of the matter. That There are those who are babes, those who are maybe young in age, or maybe not young in age, but young in the faith. And so, for various reasons, maybe have never heard this subject, never discussed this subject or studied it. Even more so, here in the year 2022, uh, and I think, I think the fair is a pretty good illustration of this. If, if we had been able to be doing this, say, for 30 years, I wonder how different it would have been to be at the fair, at the booth 30 years ago. Would there have been any different in the interest that people passing by would have had? Would there have been any difference in the knowledge of those passing by that they had? I, I don't know that I can completely answer the question, but the people don't talk about the Bible today as much as they used to. I'm fairly certain of that. One illustration of that is that it used to be that there were debates on not just this subject, but other subjects. I mean public debates. Uh, notice... Turn that off. Notice this. The, the Baptists of the middle part of the 17th century were controversialists. They were compelled to debate. The Episcopalians, Presbyterian, Brownists, and Independents agreed with each other only in one particular of hating the Baptists. And the point of this author is the, the Baptists, they, they would go out and they would challenge the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and the Catholics. And guess what? The Catholics and the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians, they would accept the challenge. 
uh, various leaders in these religious groups would say, okay, for one week at 7 o'clock every night, we're going to get together and we're going to debate the subject. What does the Bible say? Or whatever sources they might refer to. But on this subject that we're looking at this morning or others, it used to be that the leaders had no problems uh, acknowledging, well, we disagree, and it matters that we disagree. Let's open the Bible and see what it says. And not only was there a willingness by the leaders, but then they weren't teaching to an empty auditorium. There would be people, there would be hundreds sometimes. Sometimes people would drive for hours to be able for one night or two nights or maybe more than that to sit and to listen to both sides. Ima imagine that, a society where people would listen to both sides and then question themselves and question others. And then after the debate is over, people stand around and talk to each other and they go meet maybe somebody who sits on, who's sitting on the other side and has some follow-up questions and discussion. There was a time where even the young were exposed to this for reasons such as this and other reasons. Have any, have any of our children here ever attended a public religious debate? I assume not. Have any of our children even heard of, heard of such? Uh, maybe if they've looked at a, at a bookshelf and, and seen maybe a, a written transcript of that. So my point is, we need to discuss this because there are those who are spiritually young in the faith and who have maybe even never even been aware that there was such a, a controversy. Another reason comes in verse 14. Hebrews 5, verse 14, solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so it would be nice if we could just talk about what is right and then ignore the rest and just assume, well, since we know what is right, we would never be deceived by what is wrong. But that's, uh, that's naive at best and foolish and even sinful at worst. What this says is we've got to know the difference between what is right and wrong, and that doesn't happen by accident. That happens by us challenging ourselves, by us accepting the challenge that others may present to us uh, of what we believe, and then hopefully of, of their willingness to accept our willingness to do the same. We, we have to exercise our senses to discern both good and evil. And so because the word baptism has been misused for centuries, for centuries, we have to exercise our senses in order to understand. Another reason is in order to understand what it means to preach Jesus. I'll come back and read from Acts chapter 8 later. So for now, I'll just refer to Philip preaching to the Ethiopian. And in verse 35, he preached to him Jesus. We don't have a transcript of the lesson. But the next thing we're told is that the Ethiopian, having heard Jesus preached, he saw some water, and the very next thing he says is, what, see here is water, what hinders me to be baptized? Apparently, water baptism is a part of preaching Jesus. That means it's a part of hearing Jesus. That means it's a part of understanding Jesus. It's not the first part. It's not the most important part, but it's a part of it. And so, we need to understand what happened that day and what we need to be practicing and teaching today. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, John warns that many false prophets have gone out into the world. In fact, he says, test the spirits, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Notice, he doesn't say many false prophets will go out into the world. That, that's true, but John's writing, and in the, in the lifetime of the apostle John, he says, already many false prophets have gone out. False teachings were spreading in the, in the lifetime of the apostles, and we have some of, some of the errors that were being spread uh, recorded in Scripture, but not all of them. There, there's a document, I don't know that I even know how to pronounce it correctly, but it's called that, and uh, people who study manuscripts and such say that it, this was probably written in the second century. Now remember, the second century is not the 200s. The second century is the 100s. Just a few decades after the death of John. Just several decades after the gospel was introduced. 
read with me something that, again, is said to have been written just a few decades after Scripture was written. But concerning baptism, thus shall ye baptize. Having first recited all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, And I don't know if that means the formula as though you had to say those words or if it means upon the basis and the power and the authority of. But anyway, baptize in living water, running water. Someone said, you you need to baptize in running water. But if thou hast not living water, then baptize in other water. And if thou art not able in cold, then in warm. But you need to baptize in cold water. Now, if you can't, not a problem up here, but if you can't, well, then, then go find some warm water. But if thou hast neither, then pour water on the head thrice in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But before the baptism, let him that baptizeth and him that is baptized fast and any others who are able. And thou shalt order him that is baptized to fast a day or two before. There... There was no Catholic Church. This was, this was not just believed by some, some fringe freak. This, this was written by someone uh, of enough importance that this document was, was written down and preserved. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we've got it well enough. We can, can, can tr- translate it and know some of the things that were being taught. Again, just a few decades after Scripture, the New Testament was written. So this is, this is no recent, this is no American controversy. Look how many things, I won't go back through it, you see them. How many things people are already adding to what the Scripture says. Cold water, and do this three times, and, and pour water, we're going to talk about that, but that's not all. Afterwards, you need to tell that person he needs to fast. So... Even so-called early Christian writings uh, can't be fully trusted. We, we have to test the spirits. And so that's why we need this study. Because Christians have been needing this study for hundreds and hundreds of years. We also need this study because what I believe on this subject and how I reach a conclusion about what baptism is and what I should do with the water, however I reach my conclusion about that, is also going to affect other, other beliefs that I have and how I answer other questions. There are other words in the Bible that, beside baptized that we don't use on a regular basis, that are probably not a part of our daily vocabulary, that are maybe even only words we only say when we're reading the Bible or talking about such things. The word Christ, that's a word we, we only use in a religious context. Uh, the word bishop, or fellowship, or nakedness maybe. These are words, again, they're just not common. So how, how do I know what those words mean, since I didn't maybe grow up using them or hearing them frequently, outside of a, a religious or spiritual context? How am I going to learn what those words mean? Well, the way that I learn what this word means, I'm going to use that same method, I'm going to take that same approach in learning what other words mean. Well, how and when did Jesus promise to forgive sinners? Uh, this morning, no debate over who forgives sin and, and why sin can be forgiven. We've been reminded of that. But when does that provide forgiveness? My answer to this imp- impacts my answer to that. Our teachings that are, or practices that are not in the Bible but that have been accepted for hundreds and hundreds of years of people sincere in many ways in their faith, uh, just as important as teachings that are in the Bible and that maybe have been rejected by people sincere in many ways. Who is my brother? When I, when I meet someone in the course of getting to know them, how, how could I know if they are a Christian or not. I, we can never know the depths of anyone's heart in that sense. But as far as the things that they could tell me, that they believe, that they would teach, that they have and, and would practice, that, that's the best that I can do. Like, like Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9, they, they didn't believe he was a believer. 
And then later they were convinced that he did. So to, to, to some degree, I, I have to know someone and at some point know them well enough that I make a decision, well, I believe they are a Christian or I do not believe that they're a Christian. The way that I answer this impacts the way that I answer that. Are things approved as long as they are not specifically forbidden? The way I answer this may contributes to the way that I answer that. And then one more. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 28. As we read earlier, we have to be able to discern both good and evil. And not only is that important and even practical, Colossians 1 verse 28, this is a part of what it means to, to, to teach about Jesus, to preach Jesus. Paul says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. And if you read chapter 2, that's what Paul does in that whole, what we say, that, that whole chapter, that whole section. He, he warns and then he teaches. He warns them about error and then tells them the right direction and then warns of the wrong direction and then points them back to Christ. And so a part of preaching Christ is teaching the, cru- the, the truth of who he is and what he has said and what he expects. But preaching Jesus all, also means warning about false claims of who he is and what he has said and what he expects. So, hopefully it's clear, and maybe we already understood the importance of this, but we need to study this subject from from time to time. So, is baptism pouring, sprinkling, and or immersion? One way to help answer that is, well, where, where did such a practice begin? What about pouring water? Where did that begin? Well, we read a few minutes ago, just a few decades after the, the, the scriptures were written, just a few decades after the apostles had spread the gospel, there were already people saying, well, in this circumstance, if, if, you, don't have, if you don't have warm water or cold water or a certain kind of water, running water, living water, will then do something different. And so in that case, someone came up with the idea that you could pour water. I don't read about water being poured in Scripture, but we can read about it soon, relatively soon thereafter. What's the origin of sprinkling? The first recorded case of that is in the year 251, so about another hundred years after this document that I read from a moment ago was written. It's interesting, we even know the individual and the circumstance. There was a man named Novation, and he was on his deathbed, or at least he thought he was. And so since he was on his deathbed, it was decided that he had, had never been baptized. It was decided we're going to sprinkle water on him. That's just, I guess, what they thought. That was the best that we could do. Interesting thing is he recovered. <laughs> he didn't die. And because after that then, he, he was not baptized. He, didn't, do, he wasn't, didn't have water poured on him or immersed in water. There was controversy. There were people who thought, well, we only did that because you were on your deathbed, but now you're not on your deathbed, so you should go back to the rule and not, not, go, not depend upon the exception. And it was so controversial that here we are in the year 2022, and we know the man's name, and we know the circumstances of it. So not just that it happened, but it was written about by, by enough people, and it was written about by people important enough in the eyes of someone that what they wrote was preserved. Do you think in 2,000 years anybody is going to know anything that you have written down? I'll speak for myself, no. But here, somebody, and probably more than one, wrote about it, and what they wrote was preserved, and we found it, and we know about this controversy in the year 251. Then, sprinkling was, was questioned. It was controversial, and as far as I can tell, that's the first time it was practiced or at least as far as we know. Go back to Acts chapter 8. I don't know of of any any religious group or individual who, when looking at this subject, says, well, no, immersion, that is definitely not baptism. These other things, you, you could pour or sprinkle, but no, immersion doesn't qualify. That, that's about the, the only part of this subject that isn't controversial. In Acts chapter 8, as we noted earlier, 
the eunuch, uh, Philip, preached Jesus to the eunuch, and as he said, see, here is water, and then what hinders me from being baptized after he confesses his faith, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and then I, I want you to picture this as, as I read it. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Has he been baptized yet? No. That doesn't mean they both went under the water. They both walked down into the water and he baptized him and then they came up out of the water. This, this is clearly immersion. Uh, if, if it was sprinkling, only one of them even needs to get out of the chariot. If he was going to sprinkle water on him, the eunuch could have stayed in the chariot and Philip just goes down and gets a little water in the cup of his hand and he could sprinkle it or pour it on him. They don't even both need to get out of the chariot. They don't both need to go... They could get out and go into the water and just, you know, maybe be ankle deep and sprinkle or pour water on him. But going down into the water isn't just getting your toes wet, is it? They both went down into the water and he baptized him and then they came up out of the water. This, this is probably the case of where the most amount of information and detail is given that shows conclusively this this was immersion if someone wants to suggest it could have been anything otherwise uh, we can ask for the evidence but this would be not necessarily the first time but just because of the example that's given here we can find in scripture there definitely was the practice of immersion we can do a word study of this of the word baptism uh, dictionaries can be helpful as we study to help us and others avoid uh, just basically making up our own definition of words as is increasingly common in our society in different ways. So a, a dictionary still is written by man and so it, it, you can question it but it, 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 it can, can be helpful and, and have a role. If you're going to use a, a dictionary it's, it's best in a Bible study it's best to find a Bible dictionary which is just a, a dictionary that's defining the way that words were used at the time that the Bible was written, whether it's Old Testament Hebrew words or New Testament words, usually Greek. That's the benefit of a, of a Bible dictionary. So let me just give a couple of examples. I, I don't have the personal training uh, of, of Greek or Hebrew, so I'm just relying on the scholarship of others in this part of our study, not, not for what I believe Is that still my connection, probably? Okay. All right, maybe it'll come up, maybe it, maybe it won't. Let me just read to you. There's a, a Greek dictionary uh, written by a man named Strong, and so he defined the word baptize, the Greek word baptize, to immerse, submerge, to make whelmed, uh, or fully wet, and then he says used only in the New Testament of of ceremonial ablution. I think that word ablution means washing. So especially of the ordinance of Christian baptism. Uh, another dictionary written by a man named W.E. Vine. So he defines baptism as consisting of the process of immersion, submersion, and, emerg and emergence. So in other words, going under and then coming back up. Uh, one interesting thing is that if you look at a Bible dictionary, and you look at the name of the person who wrote it, always it's someone, uh, a scholar in, in the language that he's writing. And if you go back and, and look up the names of the, the people who are writing those dictionaries, ignore this for a moment. If you look at the names of those people and then go back and find, well, where were they trained or even what were their, uh, what were their, their personal religious beliefs and teachings? Many times the people writing these dictionaries actually were members uh, of religious groups that practice pouring, sprinkling, or immersion. So in their personal practice, they, were, they usually just took all of the above approach. But when they were defining the word, when they were just using their, their study and their training, they would admit, well, baptism meant immersion. When we do a word study, we might use an English dictionary, and that's okay as long as we recognize 
when you use an English dictionary, you're not, look, you're not being told what that word meant in the times of the first century. An English dictionary is telling you how Americans use that word. And so, just important to understand that. So if you look up baptize or baptism in an English dictionary, then it's going to say to immerse in water, or sprinkle, or pour water on in the Christian rite of baptism. And then even a couple of, of other definitions. So, English dictionaries are going to tell you the way it's used in our time. And so that's going to reflect a difference. But... If you maybe you only have access to an English dictionary, if you go down, sometimes dictionaries will give some history of the word. I think that's called etymology, some background. Well, why did we pick that word for that thing? Why do we use the word book instead of apple to describe a series of pages that are, are connected and, and covered on a subject? Why did we choose one word and not the other? Well, there's a whole history to it. Again, I, I'm not a, a scholar on that, but there are such people, and sometimes you can find an explanation. Why, why is it we have the English word baptize? And then they can go through and you can read, well, it was used, there was this word back in the 1300s, and then sometimes the spelling got changed. But even with English words, if you'll go back and look at its history, then sometimes you can even get back to the original meaning. And in this case, you see that our English word baptize is from an old French word and from a Latin word and from a Greek word that means to immerse, to dip in water. So it takes a little more work, but if you just feel most comfortable with an English def dictionary, you can still get to the same conclusion that baptism means to immerse. But our faith should never depend upon a scholar uh, your faith shouldn't depend upon anyone else. It should depend upon God and what He has spoken. So a word study can be helpful, but of course, we're going to primarily go back to a Bible study to help us reach a conclusion and, and to form our faith. So what does the Bible say? Is there anything the Bible would say that would help us to make any distinction in this matter? Well, we're going to look at, at three verses. First of all, John chapter 3 and verse 23, John 3, verse 23, says, Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. So that key, John was baptizing there. The key is he was baptizing there because there was much water. So, do you need much water to sprinkle dozens or even hundreds of people? I'm pretty sure a bowl would suffice for, for, for that number. Uh, if you were pouring, well, you would need a little bit more. But to just pour water on, on someone's head, you wouldn't need a place where there was much water. But to immerse a number of people, you would. Of course, again, we're not practicing John's baptism today, but this just tells us something about the meaning of the word. Baptism requires much water. We read a moment ago and, and thought through what Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 tell us about when Philip baptized the Ethiopian. And so again, why did they both go down into the water? They both went down and then he baptized him. That would be a reflection of immersion. And throughout the book of Acts, there are, are not a, there are not many occasions, but every occasion, and not just in Acts, I mean, but every occasion where there is enough information that tells you something about the place where the baptism took place, it, it, would, it, it would involve a place that would allow for immersion. So, for example... John, we read John chapter 3, much water. Where was Jesus baptized? In the Jordan River, much water. Uh, the Ethiopian, we were not told, well, was it a pond or was it a lake or was it a river? We're not told, but it wasn't a puddle. See, here's water, and they, it was enough that they could both go down into it. Uh, Lydia, in Acts chapter 16, we're not told specifically of 
what water she was baptized in. But do you remember where Paul met her? It was by the riverside. And so that would be the, the, the likely place. So there's always much water. Can you think of any occasion of someone being baptized and a detail being thrown in that and there was a bowl of water nearby and he baptized him? There was a, a, a wet towel and he baptized him. Never any, any hint of that. Never any detail that would give any kind of a, a clue or lead to the conclusion that someone had water poured or sprinkled on them in Scripture. And one other, in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Romans 6 and verse 4. It says, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When people say that baptism is a, a symbol, well, it is a symbol of something. It's not a symbol of salvation we already received. That's commonly the, the explanation. And the question of that is, well then, where's the passage that says such? Baptism is a symbol of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. That's what is described here. And so we are, are buried. The old man is crucified. So the old man, God is going to put him to death. And then we are buried in baptism. And then we are raised. Just as Christ died, was put to death, was buried, and then he was raised. All of that same language is, is used here. In Romans 6 and verse 4, think about that phrase, buried with him in. And whenever a word, whenever there's a synonym to a word, another word that means exactly the same thing, well, you can replace, you can use, interchange those words in a sentence and it still means the same thing. So if baptism means sprinkling, then we should be able to read, buried with him in sprinkling. But that, that doesn't make sense. Buried with him in pouring. That doesn't even, even fit grammatically. Buried with him in immersion. Well, that, that even fits and flows grammatically, and then even more so consistent with everything that is said. So everything that every clue and hint and reference, those most plain and then those that are, are, are less plain, even all of them point to baptism being immersion. If if a word then begins to be altered, if we took the approach to say, well, it's just water. Let's not have a controver controversy and let's not be divided from each other about what we do with the water. We're united, although not with everyone, but if someone were to say we're united, it needs to be water. Let's not be divided over how to use the water. Let's just use the water. The problem is there, there's no stopping place. If, if the Bible teaches we are to be immersed, well, then we can't do something different with the water. Pour it or sprinkle it. If we do, why, I've wondered at times, why does it just, why is it only pouring or sprinkling? Uh, why not splashing water on someone? You know, as we sing, look, there is, is a, a crimson tide. Well, then how about we give a tide of water? Could we, if we splashed water on someone, like a, a wave, would, would that be baptism? I've always thought I could make a pretty, spiritually sounding explanation for drinking water you know drinking water that gives us life and, and it's it's an inward cleansing not not an outward cleansing an inward cleansing and because christ is going to be in us i think i could make that sound really spiritual and convincing except for the fact that i don't read it in the bible and that doesn't reflect the word baptism could we just get a wet towel and, and just wipe someone again you could you could make a Spiritual sounding explanation and being washed from my sins. Well, how do you wash? Well, we get in the bathtub and we got a wash rag and we wash the dirt off of us. So I could, I could make it sound good. But the problem is I don't read any example that doesn't fit with the word. That, does it matter what we do with the water? Well, only if what God has said indicates that he had something specific in mind for what we should do with the water. So if we do a Bible study, then we conclude that baptism 
is immersion. People will ask questions sometimes because, like in those who did of Jesus, they're trying to justify themselves. But some people ask questions because they've never even thought of this before. And I mean, some have never thought that baptism is only immersion. They've never had a friend. They've never had a conversation about this. They've only heard and they've only seen, uh, uh, maybe only sprinkling or pouring. And so people will ask questions. We want to be prepared to the best of our ability to give an answer. Some people might say, so are you saying that I am lost or others are lost because we use water in a different way? How, how might you answer that question? One thing that's important is that we might clarify, well, what do you mean we use water in a different way? No, we're not saying anybody is lost because they use water in a way that is different from us. We, we don't compare anybody. Well, they're, they're right because they do it the same as we do. They're wrong because they do it the same as we do. That's not how we do it. They're right if they do it the same way that the Bible teaches that God has said, and we're right if we do it the same way the Bible does. We don't compare us to them or them to us. We compare them to the Scripture. We compare us to the Scripture. And so we might help others to be sure we clarify that. But the issue is not our way versus your way, but what is God's way? And compare them to God's way and us to God's way. Romans 10, verse 17, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So what can we hear from Scripture about pouring water? What can we hear from Scripture about sprinkling water? Uh, we'll read some references about sprinkling blood, sprinkling blood cleansing. And in Hebrews chapter, I think, 10, it talks about the blood of Christ being sprinkled on our heart. That's right. The blood is sprinkled on our heart. That cleanses us. But that same verse says our bodies are washed with pure water. What can we hear by faith? Or what, what can we hear about immersion in water, then we need to act based upon what we hear. And if sprinkling or pouring water is not God's way, then no one is saved by using water that way. Secondly, and just briefly, well, what about people who can't be immersed in water because of exceptional circumstances? They're out in the desert and there's no water around. Uh, they're, they're on their deathbed and there's no way, no way to move them. Uh, you remember a few minutes ago that it seems that's how the practice of sprinkling was introduced. Well, there's just this exception, so we have to make an exception to, to the rule because of this circumstance. Well, do you, uh, do you have the authority to make an exception to a rule? I don't. Jesus does. And it, in the case of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, he said, here's the rule. But then he said, except. So only in the case of sexual immorality and so on. Uh, think about where the exception on that one case, back in the year 251 with, when water was sprinkled on that man. Now look where that has led to. And not that that was the only event, but that certainly contributed to, and now we not only know about it, but that's the conviction of many people. So inventing an exception because of a unique circumstance is we don't have authority to do that. But think about, in Mark chapter 2, you remember there was a lame man. He couldn't go, he, he apparently had heard about Jesus and Jesus' ability to heal, but he couldn't get there. He couldn't walk. You remember how he had four friends and how they got him to Jesus? Remember the case where they took a panel off of the roof, they opened the roof, and they let him down uh, let his bed down beside Jesus, and then he was healed. Uh, there's, there's some more, like all often the case, there's some backstory too that I'm interested in. Who, who came up with that idea? Was, was that his idea? He was so desperate to be healed that he called for his friends and said, hey, I've been thinking, if you'd come over here and each of you take a corner, and then somehow you get me up on the roof, I think we could do this. I don't know if that was his motivation or if he had a friend who cared about him so much that that friend was at home thinking, how can I get this guy to Jesus? How can I get him? Hey, if me and Larry, Moe, and Curly, if we, we go and, and we all carry, yeah, we could, we could do that. 
So I, I don't know. I don't know whose idea it was. The point is, when there are exceptional circumstances, people who are desperate enough will find a way. And I trust God will help them find a way. They did in, in Mark chapter, chapter 2. There, there are people sometimes who are in a desert. But here's a photograph of someone. Notice, they've dug a hole, and then they put plastic in the hole, and then they filled that up with enough water to immerse someone. Someone could be baptized in the desert. Maybe if you've been at a, at a hotel, you've seen the swimming pool. They have, I don't know what it's called. It's called a gurney, but something you could, they could be, that could put someone down into the water. All hospitals have, have that. I've been in the Philippines where many times people will be baptized in a barrel. Think of that. You just fill it up. The person climbs in and they just bend their knees and they can be immersed in water. So don't even have to have a river in, in every case. If any man speaks, 1 Peter 4.11, let him speak as the oracles of God. Whatever you do, even in exceptional circumstances, whatever you do in word or deed, we sing that song, you can finish that verse. Do all in the name of the Lord. So if there's someone who knows they are in their sin and they're lost in their sin and they want God's forgiveness and they, they're determined to follow God's way, then I believe there are people who, who will get creative and they'll figure out a way to do what God has told them to do. And if they have people who know them and love them and have helped to teach them, who will, who, they'll, they'll also help to find a way instead of creating an exception to the rule. And then one more, just because people often think this way in a lot of different areas. Well, but God didn't say not to. God didn't say not to sprinkle water. God didn't say not to pour water. And again, that, that's a long list of things, isn't it? God didn't say not to eat the Lord's Supper on Tuesday. God didn't say not to burn incense to Him to worship and not to play songs to Him to worship. And as you're preparing your lunch today, uh, it probably never occurred to you, but where in the Bible did God say not to eat human flesh? I know that's gross, but not in all societies and all cultures. People have done that. Why would it be wrong to eat human flesh? I can't find a passage that tells you not to. But I can find passages that tell us what is for food. And I can't find anywhere that e eating human flesh is approved. So before we start compiling a list of doing things just because God said not to, then our, our menu might have to change. But we're not going to base our faith and our belief, our practices upon what God did not say because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so let's walk by faith. And so if God has, has expressed something about baptism, if the word baptism is something specific in using the water, then it matters because without water, am I in the kingdom? He who is born of, unless a man is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Without the one baptism, have my sins been forgiven? Because Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized. What did that mean to do with the water? for the remission of sins. Without the one baptism, my sins haven't been forgiven. I actually have never called on the name of the Lord because that's not a prayer. Saul of Tarsus was told, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Our baptism is an appeal to God by our deeds for His help and for His forgiveness. And without it, I haven't made the, haven't gone through the appeals process. We read earlier from Romans chapter 6 that we're baptized into death. We're baptized into His death. We're baptized into Him. Baptized into Christ. And so, without the one baptism, I've not been baptized into Christ. If I'm not in Christ, where am I? I'm out of Christ. And I can't be saved outside of Christ. As many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So if I haven't been baptized into Christ, 
I'm not in him, and he's not in me. I have not put him on. By one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. And so without that baptism, I'm not in the body. Does that matter? Well, when we know who the head of the body is, we know it matters. And then last, Peter says it as plain as can be. He talked about Noah and that God used water to save Noah. And the like figure we're into baptism does also now save us. And so if I am without that baptism, then I am without that salvation. Understanding baptism is not the first thing that probably most people in Fairbanks need to hear and need to understand. It's not the most important part of God's teaching. They need to know there is one Father and one Lord and one Spirit. And then they, they need to know there is one faith. There is one message that God has revealed. And they need to know of that that Lord died upon the cross and arose from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins. And then we need to do our best with whatever opportunities we have to help others to know what the Lord has revealed, what the will of the Lord is concerning baptism. Maybe this is a review for, for most of us, but sometimes as we review the first principles, we examine our own conscience and realize we're separated from God. If there's anyone here that find, you find yourself outside of Christ because you've never been forgiven of your sins. Maybe your faith has only been the faith of your family. But if today you're ready from your own conviction to confess that faith, to confess the Savior, and you're ready to leave your sins, then He'll take your sins away. If you're ready this morning to be baptized into Christ, if as a Christian you need to, to turn back to Him, if you once turned to Him but you've turned away, and we can pray for you and encourage you and stir you up again. Tell us how we could help as we stand and sing.